In the outskirts of Pasay City near Rojas Boulevard lies an eerie and abandoned little theater that holds a gruesome history, held hidden in slumber for decades now. This building is known as the Manila Film Center, situated beside the Western Philippine Plaza Hotel at the far end of the reclaimed area within the CCP complex. Back then, it was a symbol of glamour where Hollywood celebrities used to walk and celebrate. These days, it is known for its creepy ghost stories and has now become a popular site for people looking for a scare. Known by locals as one of Manila's most haunted buildings and the Philippines' largest tomb. Join us as we unravel the origin behind its silent facade and gloomy outlook. The Manila Film Center project was believed to be conceptualized because of two persons, American film director Francis Ford Coppola and Australian film director Peter Weir, both heralded as two of the greatest directors of all time. Both had plans to direct a movie about Asia at that time and had focused their attention on filming in the Philippines rather than Vietnam and Indonesia respectively. Then First Lady Melda Marcos, known for wanting the country to be a global icon for its stature and glamour, was delighted with this endeavor and soon thought of this as an opportunity. Thus, the idea of an official national film archive was born, something that did not exist in the country during that time. It was also befitting as it was one of her advocacies was to promote Filipino culture and heritage to which having this film archive will presumptuously bring pride and glory to the nation and be acclaimed globally. She desired to have a grand film festival in the country that rivals that of the prestigious Cannes Film Festival in France, and in its helm is the Manila Film Center that will bring this into fruition. Touted ambitious, the Film Center project was visualized to have the following functions. A 360-degree theater, for showcasing past and present historical tourist scenes, the film financing and loan program to cater funding for movie producers, Filipino film archiving using digital storage, though limited at the time, for preservation of Filipino movies, film database and information system for hosting movie metadata, filmmaking and blow-up laboratory, viewing room for the board of censors, and other subcomponents. In plain sight, the project was envisioned in goodwill, seeing how much function it holds and how it will nurture and preserve the cultural heritage as a whole. However, others were skeptical about the idea, thinking it was too extravagant and idealistic, and was nothing more than another icon of the Marcus's edifice complex, a term coined by architect Gerard Lico, defined as an obsession and compulsion to build edifices as a hallmark of greatness. As if foretelling enough, some others thought that it might end up in a disaster. Despite all the criticisms claiming an extravagant public relations ploy designed to give credibility to a regime they saw repressive and dictatorial, Imelda retaliated with conviction and power. Back then, the First Lady had the power to get everything she wanted. So goes the saying, what the First Lady wants, the First Lady gets. In 1969, she spearheaded the idea of building the Cultural Center of the Philippines, together with national artists for architecture Leandro Loxin. In 1974, she wanted to build a majestic theater that would host the Miss Universe pageant that year. She again directed her vision to architect Leandro Loxin, who then designed the 8500-seater Folk Arts Theater building, which was completed in a record 77 days. On Valentine's Day the next year, the Philippine Heart Center was inaugurated through Presidential Decree No. 673, designed by architect Jorge Ramos, with an estimated budget of $50 million. This was the first of a string of designer hospitals that were the collective brainchild of Imelda. 
Other institutions that followed were Philippine Children's Medical Center, established in April 1980, Long Center of the Philippines, established in January 1981 under Presidential Decree No. 1823, and National Kidney and Transplant Institute, which was established in the same month. Banking on the success of these previous endeavors, she bolstered the idea of having that National Film Archive and how it would further glorify the country as this will boost the sales of international films due to its strategic location. Imelda was quoted on the reason for her extravagant architecture projects as to show the world that see, we have a pretty face. And so, with little to no opposition, the construction of Manila Film Center was approved with a proposed budget of $25 million. The date was set for the Manila International Film Festival. January 18 to 29, 1982. Having less than half a year to prepare everything, Imelda nominated architect Troy Lan Hong to design the blueprint and Technology Resource Center Senior Tech Officer Ramon Ignacio to conceptualize the project. Supervising project operations at its helm is Betty Benitez, spouse of then Ministry of Human Settlements Deputy Jose Conrado Benitez. As mentioned in the book Edifice Complex, Power, Myth, and Marcus State Architecture by Gerald Lico, her instructions were clear to the project team. Recapture in that building the grandeur of the Parthenon through the application of modernist abstraction and vernacular interventions. She wanted the Manila Film Center to be the Philippine version of the Parthenon, a temple built by the Greeks to worship the goddess Athena. While the grand plan was for the building to host a multitude of functions, the project blueprint ended up with only two, the auditorium and the archives. They also ended up seeking the assistance of UNESCO for the design, and that assistance would prove to be invaluable to the project that they ended up as consultants. Architect Froilan Hong worked on the design for 77 days, compiling various abstract references as well as bits of inspirations from the Parthenon. And with the design's approval signed in October, construction only has three months to go before the target date. Since there was very limited time before the festival, and Imelda was known to be a believer in 24-hour labor, they hired around 4,000 construction workers to build the project. Workers are on a three-shift rotation every 24 hours, making sure the project is working and progressing around the clock. According to kept records, the grand lobby of the film center was completed in three days' time, a record that will leave one in awe when one realizes that in a normal construction time frame, the same section would take about six weeks, more than a dozen times longer. For the first few weeks, construction has been progressing fast because of this tight rotation. In a matter of a month, the building had already reached the fourth floor of construction. But all this haste of progress would soon come to a terrifying tragedy that would leave an already angered nation further into disgust. November 17, 1981, 3 a.m., deep in the quiet outskirts of Ross Boulevard, while the nation was peacefully sleeping, night shift workers were pummeling dirt and dust into the pavement, pouring quick dry cement over the level scaffoldings of the fourth floor. While several men were pouring an additional layer of the cement to the floor, the whole scaffolding collapsed off its hinges, its steel bars and wet cement plunging down to the ground floor. Hundreds of workers on the fourth floor immediately lost footing and fell together with the cement and scaffoldings that were holding the floor all together. A huge hole insinuated the area, with dust spewing all over the area of broken wood and metal. Several workers who were within the area where the cement collapsed were the first to pummel the ground beneath, carrying with them the cement that was yet to dry. Due to the intensity of the fall, those workers got their bodies buried into the cement. Some were buried completely, their limbs protruding out of the cement that was quickly becoming their grave, while some were completely covered up by the wood, cement, and metal rubble that fell after them. There were others who were not lucky enough to survive the fall, 
suffering a hardly gruesome fate, getting impaled by the steel bars. In the cold of the midnight, what should have been a regular eight-hour work shift turned into a dusty rubble of cement, wood, metal, and human body. And so, on-shift construction workers immediately acted to rescue their comrades. The site has become ground zero filled with fear, despair, and anger. Everyone on site was in full adrenaline and quick on their feet to act to rescue their injured fellow co-workers. Jack hammers were deployed later on, breaking down large pieces of cement that were already hardened. Ironically, at the center of the debris pile is an engineer named Benigno Aquino, the same as the exiled senator who was known as a Marcus critic. Back then, the country was in the midst of martial law. The press was in a blackout and the government had full control of what is and what is not to be aired. Media and medical personnel and even local respondents were refused entry to the area and were not able to gather any information up until noon, after almost nine hours had already passed. This was because as soon as the news of the tragedy reached public, a blanket of security was fenced around the building, preventing food access and only letting people see the tragedy from a distance. Nena Benigno, former public relations officer for the experimental cinema of the Philippines, and daughter of press secretary and columnist Teddy Benigno shared. What I understood was the fourth floor. They had put quick dry cement on each floor. And you're supposed to put that layer by layer until it dries. Then you put another layer. Because of the rush, they poured over too much cement and it fell over the night shift. The workers. That was the fourth floor. From a distance, I could see people in stretchers being carried out, frozen in cement. When I got there, they were still digging out people. It was not completely hard, and there was a guy that they were trying to keep from going into shock. Half of his body was buried. He was alive, but half buried. I don't know what it was, but to keep him awake, alert, not to go into a coma or shock, they kept him singing Christmas songs. I was watching this. With a media blackout in full effect, and the lack of sense of urgency to act on the incident. Many theories sparked among the public about the gruesome deaths of the construction workers. There was this belief that a nine-hour delay from the time of the incident and the respondents acting on it was a direct result of both the government's incompetence and an attempt to dissuade the negative backlash it will incur to the public, with well knowing how feverish the time frame for the construction was. Everyone involved in the project admitted that the three-month timeline was highly impossible from the construction workers themselves who just wanted a day-to-day -day paycheck and eventually wouldn't mind it, to the architects and engineers who planned everything. There were also stories that surfaced saying that the first lady got worried more about the status of the building's completion rather than the workers' safety upon hearing the incident. She ordered that the building should be completed at all costs and rescue attempts would only delay the already tight timeline. In response, Project Supervisor Betty Benitez ordered more quick drying cement be poured over whatever has been destroyed, and that includes the order pouring it over the buried bodies of the workers. Those who were still alive were ordered to be buried instead of being rescued. Those who had hands and feet sticking out of the cement were ordered to be chopped off to flatten the ground. With this gruesome happening, the bodies of the men who got stuck in the cement were buried in the foundations of the theater. Mila Dorin, head of the marketing of the film festival, was quoted. I was told they just cut up all the ones that were exposed, removed and built over, which is why the seats are very steep. It was a rush job, so there people were just, you know, they had to finish it, period. It was also reported that the death toll included women and children, most likely to be the families of some of the construction workers who ended up staying on the construction site as their temporary home while the project was ongoing. On the other hand, Eliodor Pogno, a project contractor, released a separate statement saying that all the bodies were recovered and they were all given proper burials. It was later reported that the bodies recovered were cremated on the shores of Manila Bay, a few kilometers off the site. Published reports also tallied the death count around only seven, but the swirling rumors tallied the count at around 168, almost all of which were buried alive. Baltazar Enriga, former chair of the Cultural Center of the Philippines, 
supposedly once estimated it at 30, while a group of psychics was heard saying it could be more than 100. According to the Marcos controlled press, 28 workers were killed in the accident. To this day, there never has been a confirmed death count on the tragedy. January 18, 1982, day of the highly acclaimed first Manila International Film Festival. Despite local rumors that the building has now become a haunted building, with the ghost apparitions of the buried roaming around, construction has progressed steadily since the incident and has almost completed the work. There were also rumors that a fortune teller allegedly told the first daughter, Aimee Marcos, to not step into the building, otherwise the spirit's roaming will take her life. Thus, several efforts to cleanse the building took place a few days before the festival. Exorcism rites, Catholic rites, pagan rites, and even Chinese rites were performed almost one after the other in an all-out effort. Building officials were given amulets, or anting anting, to ward off evil spirits. In the wee hours of that morning, several Igorots performed the last cleansing ritual before the event, the Kanyao rites. These were Igorot shamans carrying chickens and pigs, decorated with the majestic costumes of their tribe. At the crack of the dawn, they were flailing atapis around their bodies in a circular motion. They sang their tribal songs, lamentations, and prayers to their ancestors. Every now and then, they would pause their ritual dance to drink rice wine, or basi, and then continue with their routine dance. According to them, the originators of the festival had to join in so that the ritual may further succeed. Included amongst the ritual was a rice threshing dance routine with the tapis circling round and about their well-decorated bodies, while two Igorot medicine women led the tribe. At the near end of the tribal ritual, they would slit the body of the chicken and pigs open, its innards oozing out in the open ground as a sacrifice to appease the uneasy souls wandering around. On top of the cleansing rituals, Reports said that even on the day of the festival, construction was still ongoing to polish the building hours before the official opening. The event was supposed to start at 7.30 p.m. in the evening, but the workers were still sweeping dust even 15 minutes before the start. Imelda arrived that opening night wearing a Joe Salazar terno in black and emerald green collar with layered peacock feathers. About 300 guests arrived wearing elegant long gowns and formal trousers. Numerous stars from international scenes, such as George Hamilton, Priscilla Presley, Peter Ustinov, Jeremy Irons, Franco Nero, Ben Kingsley, and a young Brooke Shields, gallantly walked down the film palace. It has been reported at the start of the event, there was still noticeable cement dust in the air due to the ongoing work outside the film palace. There were some guests who quickly left even before the screening of the first film, Plum Flower Embroidery from China, due to some rumors that terrorists had forewarned the guests that explosives were embedded in some of the major supporting pillars of the palace, driving them anxious as they stride through the halls and went for their seats. The guests were not aware of the wet cement they were stepping on, staining their shoes and the hems of their clothes. Most of all, they were unaware of the dead bodies that were stepping onto that day. Some guests reportedly had an uncomforting experience in the steep seats they were assigned. In between days of the 12-day festival, it was highly publicized that the First Lady threw several parties for her invited guests at the Malacanang Palace. She staged a party so extravagant that her guests feasted on the classiest of roasted cow meat, all the while drinking from $100 French champagne bottles, comparing it to the Hollywood of the 1920s to Ala Cecile B. DeMille the acknowledged founding father of American cinema in a Camelot-like setting. At another glittering formal party in Fort Santiago, the first lady was in her usual dress to impress persona, and some guests had inked her style of resemblance to the Queen of England. She was dressed in a white turno with multi-carat diamond teardrop earrings, three diamond studded bracelets, and two foot diamond necklace. Shining and sparkling under the bright night lights, she danced in all jubilation over a medieval pageant together with a procession of native dancers, beauty queens, and religious floats, carrying decorated figures of the infant Jesus. 
After the parade of fireworks and dinner, she ended the night by dancing with George Hamilton and Jeremy Irons. After 12 days of the festival, the Best Film Award was given to 36 Chauringi Lane from India. For direction, Goran Markovic won for his jacks of all trades from Yugoslavia. Bruno Lawrence took the acting honors for Smash Palace from New Zealand. And Lyudmila Gurchenko won as actress in the Soviet Union's The Beloved Woman of Mechanic Gavrilov. Gallipoli won a special award for the best film for crystallizing national identity. A total of 39 countries were able to showcase their respective films and 30 Filipino films have been sold for a total of $500,000, with a film for your height only, as the most sold Filipino film, led by Filipino midget actor Wang Wang. Despite mixed emotions about whether the festival was a success or a failure, the festival was able to earn an estimated $20 million worth of bought film, giving the director substantial validation that the festival was indeed a success, despite what the critics claim otherwise. The following year, the Manila Film Festival lost its funding when the $5 million allocated budget was not approved by then Prime Minister Cesar Virata. In order to salvage what was left of the festival, Imelda ushered in the creation of an agency that would review films and approve them for screening. This agency is known today as the Movie and Television Review and Classification Board, or MTRCB, created through Presidential Decree No. 1986. At that time, the agency approved the screening of films with soft pornographic content at the Manila Film Center in an attempt to bolster its earnings and, to an extent, make up for the supposed loss of the first festival. She was quoted as, Pornography is all in the mind and the heart. If garbage affects us, then there must be something wrong with us. Despite the efforts, the money earned from these films were not enough and the festival that year would be the last of it. The building would then be left to small gatherings and events until in July 1990, when Luzon was struck by a magnitude 7.8 earthquake. This earthquake shocked almost the whole Luzon landscape and left the foundations of the Manila Film Center unstable, leaving the building endangered to its occupants and therefore was abandoned. In 2001, then CCP President Armita Rufino announced a full rehabilitation program for the deteriorating film center, saying, It is sad that something like the film center had just been sitting there and deteriorating. Such a building should be put to good use. Ed Bagnot, OIC of the CCP Film Division, added, Imelda, Ghosts, and Bomba Films. These are the things that have been associated with the center for a time, and it's about time it shed itself of such bad publicity. The Department of Public Works and Highways, or DPWH, and the Film Center's architect, Froilan Hong, were part of the strategic planning session on structures renovation. The rehabilitation cost was 300 million pesos and was then leased to CPA CAI after the renovation. From here, the Amazing Philippines Theater used the center to perform the amazing show, an entertainment delight showcasing mixture between Asian culture and mainstream pop mixed with funny and dramatic short shows, with its artists mainly composed of men and transgenders. Its lease would then expire in 2009. After the lease expired, the Philippine Senate abruptly considered moving from the GSIS building to the vacated Manila Film Center to house the congressional sessions. In 2012, the amazing Philippines Theater would regain its lease, but a fire incident in February 2013 caused structural damages to the building foundations again with an estimated damage cost of around 1.2 million pesos. This incident, coupled with uncertainty and conflicts within the Senate on how they will proceed for the setup of the building, proved to be lingering. Finally, after multiple considerations, the Senate committee headed by Senator Franklin Drilon put the migration decision on hold in February 2014. To this day, the building is still leased to the Amazing Philippines Theater, for which their show, The Amazing Show, still performs every night except Sundays. Apart from that, the building isn't anything but a shell of its former glory, 
despite how short-lived it is. It has been several decades since the incident, but the memories of what happened still lingers in the mind of the Filipinos, who remember nothing but the gruesome days of martial law. Whether the rumors of negligence are true or not, there is no denying that the events of the past continue to haunt the walls of the Manila Film Center in different ways. For one, it was a symbol of greed, with all that unrealistic timeline and lack of consideration for the people they serve with. It also became a reflection of the life of a normal Filipino human, someone who would keep their mouth shut just so they are able to feed the mouths that depend on them. Lastly, it serves as a lesson to everyone that deliberate planning is paramount that things must be well thought out instead of being rushed. Otherwise, history will only repeat itself. <laughs>